Okay. So, um, I want to quickly speak about Rock Group Hard Mode, specifically the Barsai Hard Mode uh, fight. So, I kind of want to just talk about the setup that I use, how I tank it, what I'm doing throughout that fight. And we're going to watch a video, and I'm going to tell you what's going on in the video. Um, and kind of explain to you how I'm tanking it, what I'm doing, because there's a lot of people asking about this at the minute. There's a lot of teams going in there, a lot of tanks struggling. So from the main tank point of view, I'm going to show you what it is that I'm doing in Barsai hard mode to get the clear. So um, first of all, I kind of want to speak about the setup. So the setup for this trial is pretty critical in terms of how we are kind of going about it, how we're setting it up. Now, what you will notice is a severe lack of selfish tanking gear. And the reason for that is because it's just not necessary. So I kind of played around with quite a few different setups as uh, we came into the Deadlands patch. Obviously, as you will know, Mist Form has been kind of nerfed in PvE content. It no longer works. So in Rock Grove Hard Mode, you will not be able to use Mist Form anymore, as you should know by now. Um, that was kind of the way people were getting through this fight. They were using Misform to get through the um, the Death Touch. Now, since that's no longer possible, we had to find a way now to kind of get through this fight uh, with, without Misform, basically. Now, the dot has been reduced, but this is still like one of the hardest hitting fights in the game. It's very comparable to other fights like Pine's Age's Hard Mode, Last Boss. That is a really high damage fight. This is very comparable, this one fight. And it's because once you kind of get past 90%, for the rest of the fight, you're taking almost a constant amount of damage from the death touch dot, and it's really difficult to manage. Now, the difference between like the main tank and the off tank, the main tank is taking permanent damage throughout the whole fight. So the whole length of the fight, you've got these constant ticks of damage almost the entire time. For the off tank, the off tank has a hard time in this trial as well. However... They don't have the consistent damage. So the, the main tank is taking consistent damage over the entire fight. The off tank is taking a sl like a burst of damage every time they have an abomination. So the abomination comes, there's a burst of damage, and it's a lot of damage, but it's only for a short amount of time. So they've got time to recover. They've got time to get their resources back. They've got time to go ready for the next, um, the next abomination. For the main tank, you need the longevity um, of the fight. You need to be able to go 10, 15 minutes. It depended on your group. You could be here for a very, very, very long time. So with myself, I've kind of gone with the idea that this is going to be a long fight. I'm not in a planes breaker group at this point. I was just in a progression group doing the hard mode, trying to figure out stuff. I was given the ability to kind of play around with setups and do whatever I like, which is really lucky for me, because I like to do this kind of theory crafting and finding ways to get through content. So for me, as you can see on the screen there, uh, we started off with the master weapons, the master one hand and shield. Now, this is kind of pretty important at this stage, and it also makes it difficult to run the gear, the other gear pieces that I went with. So the way that we do this is obviously we get the one hand and shield. Um, sturdy on the shield would be good. I had well fitted. I didn't really want to switch it just for this trial, but well fitted, sturdy, whatever you want to use. But sturdy would have been good here. Um, and then the multi effect enchant, the tri stat. On the one hander, if you're on a dragon knight tank. Charged weapon with a poison uh, glyph would be the best. I had an infused absorb stamina because I use this master the, this master weapon setup on all of my tanks, and I play every class of tank. So the re the only reason I wasn't using charged and a poison glyph was because I use it on other characters. But if you want to maximise your sustain, then you absolutely want to go with the charged and the poison glyph. Uh, next, we've got the Yolnukrin Ice Staff Infused Crusher. That's going on the back bar. We're using Yolnukrin in a way here where we only have it active when on the back bar. So that's pretty important for this. Um, it's also something you have to constantly remind yourself of because if you don't activate Yolnukrin, then your group's going to lose a lot of damage. But depending on what sort of group you are, this is kind of aimed at more progressive groups because, like I say, I myself, I'm not doing Planes Breaker yet. I plan on doing that in the future with a group when I find a group that I want to be in. Um, and a group that that wants me, and we'll kind of work uh, maybe a more like di like maybe a different setup then, something that pushes a bit more um, in in that kind of way. That's it's a bit more risky, but there is no risk involved here because we're just going for a standard play. We're trying to find a way. This is a progression, so most people who are going into this fight will find this setup useful because you'll be in a similar situation most likely. 
Um, the, so Yon the Crew went on the back bar. Then we went with Enkratis on the monster set. Now, the reason I went with Enkratis is because I had noticed the off tank was using Enkratis. I also then noticed that the uptime of Enkratis was about 20% on the main boss. So 20% is a super low uptime. And the problem with that is also is that Enkratis is a, like a safety set in this trial. So in Execute, there's a lot of fire damage. There's a lot of fire happening. There's lots of fire things going on. So what you don't want to do is miss out on the 5% fire reduction from wearing in Christ. That is actually the main reason why I went with it. Because if you actually look at different monster sets, I tried looking at Engine Guardian, but my sustain was okay, so I didn't need it. I tried using Earthgore. Earthgore is so, so, so bad on a tankless patch. Um, it just it just didn't give me anything. It was actually better to to not not use it um, and just go with something reducing damage instead. Um, it's just such a waste of monster. And also because you're moving a lot. In, like you'd be moving out of your earth goal. Like, yeah, you could stand still with the boss in phases, but typically you are sometimes having to kite the boss around and you're not going to be standing still long enough to benefit from earth goal, which then brings into the idea of maybe troll king and troll king kind of performs. Okay. But because we're not able to stack health recovery too high, we were stacking damage mitigation. We were stacking uh magic recovery. So health recovery was taken, uh, taking a bit of a hit. So the, the magic recovery was more important than the health recovery in this situation. So Troll King, again, wasn't providing enough. Like, Troll King is only useful if you're trying to stack health recovery. So when we look at a Cloud Rest build, for example, we use the Steed Mundus, we use Divine's Gear, we use potions that give um, extra healing over time and lingering health and things like that. Uh, we then use Troll King as well. So we've stacked health recovery, and then it's obviously more of a benefit. In this case, there's no point stacking health recovery because it just it's not enough. Because it only takes two seconds, it's not enough. So I did go with Enkratis. I also tried Malabeth and um, the Scourge Harvester set. That was really, really poor. So we did have um, a little bit of uptime on Major Vitality, but it was it was still really low. And the healing from it was one of my worst healing outputs. So the healing from it is about 5k healing, but it's spread over like multiple seconds. Um, it's not got a high uptime. It's a really poor heal. The Major, uh, the major Vitality absolutely useless um, in that situation. So I tried Malabeth. It didn't work. It just wasn't worth it. So I went with Enkratis. Enkratis has given the group the buff and it's given us the fire damage reduction. That seemed to work better for me. There was no point in using anything else. Um, next you'll see, we've kind of got two body pieces of Worm Cult. So we have got a five heavy, two light setup here. And I think that actually benefits you in this situation because it means that we've got a bit more magical recovery. It means that we've got a few other things going on. So I did use two pieces of worm because we need to have a permanent worm pull buff. And as you can see, because I needed the master's one hand and shield, that means I couldn't wear the worm cult weapons. And because Yolnukrin is a one bar set, we can keep that on the back bar, which means then we've got to kind of try and work in two pieces. Now, um, by using the gloves and the sash, that means that we're able to use a setup where um, those two slots have the lowest armor value. So we're not losing too much armor by using it on the waist and the hands. If we'd have used like a worm cult chest, for example, obviously we're going to lose loads and loads and loads of armor. So it wouldn't, it's not worth doing that. In this case, we went with, like I say, the gloves and a sash of worm and they were both sturdy. And then we finished off with uh, Yolnukrin on the chest, the legs and the feet. The jewelry is all worm cult and it's also infused and magical recovery. Now it's really important to go infuse magical recovery in this fight. When I was fully buffed in this trial, we're looking at pushing our Magicka Recovery over 3k Magicka Recovery. So every two seconds, we get 3,000 Magicka. This is so, so important. Like, I can't stress it enough how important that it is to have high Magicka Recovery in this trial. Especially if you're like a Dragon Knight main tank. Because the play style that we're going to use for this revolves around getting a lot of Magicka and spamming a lot of skills. So really, really critical. Now... In terms of our skills on the front bar, uh, we've got a very defensive front bar. Uh, we've got Pierce Armor, which is obviously uh, our main taunt, but it's also our heal. Pierce Armor is a heal in this in this situation. It's a healing skill because it's going to proc our master's sword and board. We've then got Revealing Flare, which is just there. We're not using it, or we're not using it on purpose anyway. That's reducing our damage by 10%. That's giving us major, uh, major protection. Uh, we've got Temple Guard 
this ultimate that we're not using. That's given us 5% damage reduction with minor protection. So we've got major and minor protection in this situation, which is super useful. I forgot to say as well, the Master Sword and Board is taking us to the resistance cap. So when we use Master Sword and Board and it heals us, we get resistances. That takes us to the resistance cap, which means using the two light pieces isn't a problem because we're able to hit that huge amount of resistances by using the Master Sword and Board. Master Sword and Board will give us like 9k resistances or something absolutely insane. So we're hitting those really, really high numbers. We're at the resistance cap. And we've got major and minor protection. Um, and then we've got Igneous Shield. Igneous Shield is by far the most important skill in this fight. So Barsai Hard Mode. Igneous Shield is vital. If you look on the screen just there, you'll see that I cast Igneous Shield 227 times over the duration of this fight. So it's I, it's just something that you've absolutely got to use. It is very, very important. And it's more important than trying to heal. So you've really got to kind of make sure you're using it as frequently as possible. Um, our next skill, Green Dragon Blood. Uh, this is this was used 40 times. So still quite a few times. Now, the reason I was actually using this is for the minor vitality. Um, and it's also going to give us stamina recovery. It's going to give us health recovery. It's going to give us a little bit of recovery improvement. But uh, the main reason for Green Dragon Blood is actually just the minor vitality. Increased healing by 8%. I'm not actually using it for the heal. Because what happens when you've got the death touch dot applied to you is you've got reduced self-healing. So I wasn't using Green Dragon Blood for the heal. I was using it to buff myself up so the healer could help me to heal easier. Um, so that was the main reason for that. The final skill on this bar is Unrelenting Grip. Sometimes I was helping, I was using that to chain in uh, the archers, to help chain in the archers. The main reason I was using it was to kind of give myself a free speed boost and to proc in Kratis. Now, as you can see, I cast it 80 times. The, the play style that I've got in this fight is I'm trying to maximize my casts. Per, like, I'm trying to get a really high uh, rate of, of skills cast. So, like, I'm trying to make sure at all times I'm casting a skill. I'm not standing there just holding block. If I'm not healing myself, if I'm not doing something useful for the group, I'm hitting, uh, I'm hitting Unrelenting Grip for the free speed boost and a little bit of damage. And because it's free, it's a nice skill to use. As you can see, I've cast it 80 times. So it was worth it. It was worth using, and it's good to keep it going, and it's good for that free speed boost. Um, on the back bar, I was using Frost Clench. Now, this isn't something I cast a whole lot. 27 casts of, of Frost Clench throughout this fight, and that was mainly for the debuff. Um, it was It's going to give a little bit of minor brittle. We did have a brittle warden, so it wasn't absolutely needed for that. But we are going to get the minor main when it procs the chilled effect. So it procs the chilled effect. It's a guaranteed effect every time. And that's going to apply minor main, reducing incoming damage by 5%. Not only that, but it's also going to apply major main. So Frost Clench specifically provides major main. So we're getting 10% reduced damage by major main. It then passively does minor main because what happens is it's a guaranteed chilled effect proc. So when you proc the chilled effect, that causes minor brittle, that causes minor main, it causes the chilled effect. And those are the effects of an, a chilled enemy. So we get major and minor main by casting this skill, reducing incoming damage by 15% in total. So more damage reduction. We're, we're trying to stack damage reduction. We're trying to stack damage mitigation. Um, next, we've got Crushing Shock. Now, we need Crushing Shock because we're going to be range taunting the enemy. We're going to be range taunting Barsai. Um, and then sometimes we have to run across the room to the position that we're going to stack the boss. And in that case, we have to sometimes interrupt it because you don't want to have to keep running backwards and forwards you don't want to get your curses in the group. So you have to make sure that you've got Crushing Shock there to interrupt the boss if it gets stuck halfway across the room. Sometimes you're transitioning from one side of the room to the other. If that's the case, you don't want the boss to get stuck and then you've got to run over and bash it or your group's got to run over and bash it. You just want a skill, a ranged interrupt. It's really important to have Crushing Shock. You'll be the only person in the room that's got a ranged interrupt. So you're the only person who can do it. Um, so just make sure you've got that slotted for this fight. Next skill, we've got Blockhead of Frost. So obviously we need this. Um, it's it's nice to have um, for the procking infused crusher. That's the main reason. Obviously, the to be honest, the, the only reason uh, you you use the blockade is just to proc your back bar enchant. And obviously, we didn't cast it probably enough um, as we should have done. We cast it 22 times. Now, it does have like a 14 second duration, but it doesn't have 
Oh, that's not enough uptime, really, um, compared to like when we cast in other skills. But then again, we are transitioning around the room a lot. So when we are, when the portal is active on Barso Hard Mode, we are transitioning around the room. So we can't really stand there for too long and uh, be putting down wall. There's no point because the group, if the group aren't attacking the boss and we're moving around a lot, you're going to be moving out of your wall. Uh, so you don't need to overcast that. You only really want to cast it when the boss is stationary, when you know you're not moving for a little while. Put down your blockade to make sure you've got your crusher on the boss. Uh, next skill, balance. Uh, this is, again, another skill that you want to be using um, very carefully, though. Like, you don't want to cast this when you're in the middle of a, a, like a stage where you've got the, the dot, the, the death touch dot. You don't want to use balance during that. Now, as you can see, it's probably a waste of a skill, even. It was cast five times over the duration of this fight. So if you wanted to, you could remove this. We did have a wardening group who was providing um, our major buff, um, our major resolve. So we're not using balance for the major resolve. It's more for the sustain. So those five casts where it got used, the most likely option there was the fact that we needed it because we wanted to cast balance for the Magicka. Now we get 3k Magicka back in, in place of 5k health. We're being healed so much that 5k health gets healed back, boom, really, really fast. So you don't have to worry about losing that 5k health, but just make sure you don't do it when the death touch is active. You wait until the death touch is done, cast balance, and then you should be okay. You don't want to do it the other way around. It'd be too much. Um, you'd be really making your life difficult casting it during that phase. Um, next skill I used was race against time. Now, this is kind of a little bit of, this is a little bit of a waste, if I'm being completely honest with you. Um, if you're using unrelenting grip, that's a free speed boost. Now, I just liked having Race Against Time. It was like a bit of a, a bit of a safety skill in a way. Because if I started running away from the boss, I don't want my speed boost to end when I'm in the middle of the room. So I was kind of making sure I got the boss taunted and then I'm sprinting to the other side of the room at the right time and I would cast Race Against Time. Obviously, I cast it 12 times. So I did cast it quite a few times when I had to transition around the room. And sometimes when you've got to move really fast, it was just helpful to have it. But you could quite easily replace this for something else. Um... But I, I personally liked to have it. Typically, you might not have chains. Like, I was only using chains for Encratis because I wanted to have sustain on my front bar. I wanted to have sustain with my one hand and shield by using the infused absorbed stamina, or in, in the DK's case, a charged poison uh, one hander. So you you could you could kind of abandon unrelenting grip for a proc in Encratis if you don't need to, but yeah, Race Against Time would have more use if I wasn't using Chains in this case. So, there we go. And then finally... Okay, so I had Magma Shell slotted. Now, the reason I had Magma Shell slotted is because what happens is, in a progression group... Okay, not, we're not talking about Planes Breaker. We're talking about a progression group trying to get their first ever um, Rock Grove clear. Their Rock Grove Hard Mode clear. You are not going to be pushing... Abomination after abomination, damage after damage, high damage after high damage. You're not going to be pushing the boss. You're most likely going to have a 10 to 15 minute fight on Barsai Hard Mod. Now what happens is, in this situation, your whole group are sitting on ultimates until um, until an ad appears. So the abomination comes in, people drop their ults. A second abomination, abomination might come in, you drop ults. And then you kite the boss around the portal and there's no damage. So you're not using any ultimates. So everyone's got their ultimate again. And then when you go back to your position, portal gets done, boom. Alts go down again. You end up sitting on alts the whole time. So what we found is that my horn was never getting called. So everyone else's ultimate was getting called throughout the fight. And so the raid leader asked me, can you just switch your horn off and use Magma Shell instead? And it was a good job that I did in some situations. As we were progressing through this Barsai hard mode fight, um, there were occasions where the healer died. So I, there is a healer focusing heals on me pretty much most of the fight. And what happened is... If the healer died for, for some reason, then I could obviously cast Magma Shell and then the healer would be rezzed and then I wouldn't have died. And also, there are occasions where the off tank might have died and I needed to take a, a Behemoth or an Abomination. And so in that case, I could just take both the main boss, I could take the Abomination, I might have the Bleed, I might have the Dot, and boom, I could hit Magma Shell and I could survive. And that would sometimes help carry us through to get the clear, because we did clear this more than one time. We have cleared Barca hard mode probably about 10 times in total between the two patches. So it was quite important in the end to have that available because when it all went to when it all went bad, when it all started to go bad and people are dead, I was able to kind of help to save the run by proccing a magma shell 
and being able to get through that damage. So it was really useful in this situation not and not to use a horn. Um, and because we also, like I say, we just didn't need it. We were sitting on ults. We were waiting for the portal to end. And so it wasn't necessary. The next part of this is the champion points. The champion points are pretty important here. Um, in terms of the blue CP, the slottables I went with. Ironclad, Enduring Resolve, Duelist Rebuff, uh, Cutting Defense. Now, I've seen some people criticizing Cutting Defense over the last few days. And I'll tell you why it makes no difference in this situation. So, your front bar is where you're going to spend most of the fight. And what happens is, is by being on your front bar and holding block, it's going to proc Cutting Defense. Then what's going to happen is it's going to proc your front bar enchant. So your poison glyph with your charge weapon on a DK, which is going to proc your combustion passive, which is going to give you a thousand stamina rate each time, or it's going to proc your infused um, absorbed stamina. And what this means is when you've got the dot applied to you, when you've got death touch like applied on your tank and you're taking huge damage, you can just hold block. You want to, you want to be blocking through those phases or dodge rolling. Like you never want to drop block during the death touch phase because the boss does really rapid strikes, um, like with its light attacks. It like does two light attacks really fast. If you're not blocking, they're about like seven to nine k each hit. You cannot afford to take eighteen k damage on top of the fifteen k per second death touch. You just can't do it. So that's going to cause you to die. So by being able to perma block, those light attacks go down to like two k, which means you're going to have to perma block. But it also means You've got a lot of perma block. You've got a lot of blocking throughout this fight. Yeah, you can drop block when you don't have the death touch. You've got a lot of block phases throughout. So you do want to have cutting defense for your for your sustain. If you don't, you're going to run out of stamina. But by being able to proc your front bar weapon enchant constantly, it's really really useful. It's more useful than you would believe. And because there's only ever really one thing attacking you, you've only got the boss hitting you. In the execute phase, you've got the ghost attacking you. But it's not like you're wasting your enchant. You're not wasting an absorbed stamina enchant. You're not wasting a poison enchant. You're only using it for the sustain in the first place. So cutting defense is critical, in my opinion, for this fight if you want to sustain getting through it in a progression group. In terms of the other CP, blue CP, obviously you just slot everything that's not a slottable as well. Um, and then onto the red CP, again, another vital set of um, champion points here. So you've got balanced vitality, which is going to boost our max health. This took us to about... 41k max health or, or thereabouts. 40k health is, is reasonable. It's a, it's a reasonable amount. Um, we did kind of look at the option of going for a super low health to start with. We went for a super low health setup. And that didn't work. Like I was trying to tank this. Um, I, well, I tested tanking Barsai hard mode with low health. Because when the, the death touch scales with max health. So obviously the more health you've got, the worse it is. So you're not going to go with a 100k health build. But you're also not going to go... With a 25-30k health, because the light attacks, the light attacks just hurt too much. So, balanced vitality, extra max health. Um, and then, this is why Igneous Shield is so important in this trial. So we went with Bastion, Shield Master, and Ward Master. The three things that buff our damage shields. So, one of them increases your damage shield. One of them reduces the cost of your damage shield. And one of them reduces your incoming damage by 10% when you've got a damage shield active and you're blocking. So really critical. We're getting bigger shields. We're getting like a 10k, 11k shield each time we cast Ignea Shield. It's cheaper. It was like a 3.3k cost. And then we were getting 10% reduced damage from each time we did it. So every time we cast it, we get 10% reduced damage, which was really, really important for getting through this fight. And this is why you can see I cast it 227 times within this, I think it's about a 10 minute fight. So in this like 10 minute fight, that is how many times we cast it. So this is just the basic setup for Barsai hard mod. Um, and then for your green CP, obviously you just use whatever you want. So Barsai hard mod. As we, I'm gonna play it, I'm gonna talk and explain what I'm doing as we go. Um, I'll pause it in stages so that you can see what I'm doing. And I'll explain little things. So to start off the fight, I bring it to the entrance. So the first critical point about Barca hard mode is positioning. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that the cone, the portal cone, always appears behind you and not on top of you. If you hold the boss at the edge of the room, the portal cone appears on top of you. So at the start here, you'll see me range taunt the boss in. 
I'll bring it near to the group, and then we spin it around and face it towards the exit. And then what will happen is the cone will always spawn on the exit side. And that's what you need to remember throughout this entire fight. You need to always be at the edge of the room, pointing it the other way. So you're going to see that as we go through, because if you don't do that, the cone spawns on top of you. Then your group is scrambling to get out of it. You're scrambling to get out of it. You might get pulled into the portal and you'll cause a wipe. So as you see at the start here, as we go in, we are going to range taunt this bad boy over. We let it buff up. There we go. And then we, we range taunt. There we go. And we bring it to the entrance and then we spin it around. So now the cone is going to spawn behind us. And at this bit of the fight, there's not really much happening. So down to 91%. So our, our group was pushing damage to 91% and then we stop. So we start to slow down the damage now. This is the interrupt. There we go. Bashed. And there's the portal. So now, the main thing here is, with the portal, you can see the eye and it's looking the other way. And what happens is, you need if, you, if you're on console and you don't have add-ons, the way to get through this is, obviously here on the screen, I've got a counterclockwise and there's an arrow showing me which way I need to move the boss around the room. If you're on console, you have to turn your character around, look at the portal, and after one second, it will jump one way or the other. Like, it'll, it'll, it'll be in position, pointed at the exit, and then it'll either jump really quick one way or jump really quick the other way. And that's what you're going to have to do. If you're on console, if you don't have add-ons, you've got to look out for when it shifts really quickly, and that means it's going to go that way, and then you need to start to follow the con. So on this bit of the fight now, we just move, we just keep the boss taunted, and as you can see, I'm just casting skills, I'm just pushing skills on it. A good habit to get into is dodge rolling those heavy attacks. So when the boss comes in, swings his weapons around, comes in with a heavy attack. If you don't dodge roll those when you've got the death touch, that heavy attack is quite a heavy, heavy attack. Even when, um, even with blocking, you're looking at about a 15k heavy attack. You do not want to take that heavy attack during the death touch. So you want to get into the habit of dodge rolling it and just avoiding it altogether. Um... And here we go. So we're just following the cone. Look, you just want to stand on the edge of the cone. You want to stand near the middle of the room. So we're kiting inside the middle and we're following the cone. We're keeping it taunted. We're casting a lot of skills. Um, the next, so the first abomination spawns. The first abomination spawns in. Now what we're going to do is we're going to stack the boss on top of the abomination. The off tank takes the abomination and we need to turn to the side so that we don't hit the off tank with the death touch. We don't want the off tank to get the curse. So what you need to do is you need to walk, you need to guide the boss into place and then quickly move to the side. I always tend to go um, anti-clockwise. I kind of shift really quick anti-clockwise. You're going to see that here. So I bring it in, look. And I stack it in and then I move to the side really quick, look. And then there's the off tank. The off tank's right there. And then I make sure that we're pointing it away. I took the heavy attack there because I'm not cursed yet. Right, here's the death touch. And we're just spamming Igneous Shield, we're spamming Taunt, we're hitting Green Dragon Blood. That is literally it. So, at this stage in the fight, we've got a healer over in the back corner just here. You can just see the healer. This healer is the healer that's keeping me alive. I'm spamming Igneous Shield, I'm spamming Taunt, because Taunt is also a heal, remember. We've got the Master Sword and Board on, and we're keeping up Green Dragon Blood for the Mind of Vitality. So, at this point in time, we're getting about... 11, 12k damage shields from Igneous Shield. And we've got the healer who's got heals on top of me. So that is how we're staying alive through the Death Touch. Second Abomination spawns in. And then we wait until directly after... The, we're, we're waiting now. We're waiting because... I dodge roll a heavy attack and I'm moving it close to my group. And I'm going to get ready to spin it around the way. So like I'm moving into this corner. The Death Touch happens... Now we need to get ready for the next portal. The next portal spawn in 16 seconds. So we need to move the boss into a position where it's not going to hit the group and where we can make the, the cone appear behind us. So as you can see now, my group's just to the side. The group needs to go behind the boss at this stage. They go behind the boss and the portal is going to spawn on the opposite side of the room to give us some time and some space to figure ourselves out. Now we've got the curse and the portal's coming up. So the damage dealers have to avoid me at this point because I'm about to explode. We figure out which way we're going to go. Immediately after the curse, like you're not going to get a curse straight into a curse. So as you can see, I started to move. So I had to switch position. The cone is coming around the opposite way. So I can't, I need to adjust my position, but you have to wait. You can't just start running around the room all crazy. You either have to wait until you get the death touch or wait until the death touch is finished before you start moving. So in this case, the death touch, my character exploded. The dot comes out. And then I quickly sprint to chase after the cone. 
And now you can see I've run around, I'm following the cone now, and the death touch has hit me again. You're never going to get a death touch straight after a death touch. So, so you've got that kind of, you've got a couple of seconds where you can get yourself into position. Dodge roll in those heavy attacks. Here comes the curse. It's a good idea to tell your group, tank explode in two seconds before it happens. And also, it's a good idea to make sure that you tell people if it's going towards the group. Now, I'm standing still at this point. As you can see there, so as soon as the portal guys are counting 3, 2, 1, beam, I stand still with the boss. Because at that point, we start pushing damage on the boss to get the next abomination in fast. We also don't need to keep moving because some, the, the, the portal's about to end. So what's the point in keep chasing the cone when we can start pushing damage and getting ready to move? Here we go again where we're stacking the boss with the abomination. So in this case, I kind of bring it in and I move quickly, look, to the side so that my death touch doesn't go near the tank. And we're kind of... This isn't a great stack this time. It's um, as best we could do with the situation. I couldn't stack too close because... Um, as you saw there, I had the curse. Now, I'm quickly running. One, because I don't have the death touch at this point, And I don't have anything. I avoided the healers there as I ran over. And now I'm trying to bring the boss close. But we don't want to stack the second one. We're not pushing Planesbreaker. So I'm just stacking the boss near to the group. So the group don't get the curse. We don't want the group to get the curse. So we have to bring the boss near to the group. But not on top of the group. Once they kill the abomination, they stack behind the boss. We get the interrupt. The portal's about to spawn. I've got the Death Touch, we're spamming Igneous Shield, we're spamming Taunt, we're hitting, dodge rolling those heavy attacks, and we're following the cone. Another important thing here is to make sure that you've got um, Blood Ulter. The Blood Ulter synergy saved my life so many times in this trial. Um, it's such a huge heal. You're looking at a 35k heal sometimes when you super low on health and you hit it at the right second. Um, it's, it's massive. Dodge roll those heavies every single time. There's just no need to take the heavy attacks while you've got the death touch. If you've got death touch on your character, roll, dodge, every heavy. And as you can see, it's pretty relentless. The, the death touch is there back to back. Like, it does happen. It happens, it, you explode, and a few seconds later, it's back again. So you've got a very short window of opportunity to really kind of focus on it. As you can see there, we've kept stood still. We're stacking it on the abomination. It needs interrupt a lot. Ranged interrupt. Somebody got the interrupt, but I also hit it. And then we kind of spin it round quick. It almost got the off tank there. Did you see how I kind of quickly switched it round? And then the group now are kind of focusing through. I've got the death touch. I'm dodge rolling the heavy. We're trying to stack at this point. We're trying to stack the, the main boss with the abomination to get the second one in. Here comes the second one. I move really quick this time. I move really quick. I tried to chain in and add to make it easier for my group. And then I point the boss away from the group. Look. The group are there. I point the boss away to the side. I'm dodge rolling that heavy attack. And then I'm stacking near the group. I have to be near the group. Because we can't have the um, the chains. The chains coming out the ground in the group. The, the curses need to be out of group. We've got two people kiting at the back of the room. They're kiting the chains. They're kiting the curses at the back of the room. Um, and here comes the curse again. The group go behind the boss. We've got this kind of routine going. As you can see, I turn around to look where we're going. And then because I've just exploded, I chase the cone really quick. I run around, I chase the cone. The boss can sometimes run through the middle. You've got to make sure you do not run on that middle section. Interrupt comes in. Accidentally cast a bit of uh, revealing flare there. We dodge roll the heavy attack anyway because we've got into the habit. And the portal's done already. You can see the portal beam right over in the corner. So we just stand still. And then here we go. Accidental cast of revealing flare again. Fantastic stuff. And the group have got the curse. So at this point, I'm showing uh, cursing group. I'm running in the boss here. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky because we haven't got much space here. Um, we're trying to, we're hoping that the um, the abomination gets pushed quick. And there we go. And then we're getting ready for execute now. So in the execute phase, we're always stacking the boss near the portal. So at this point, we've slowed down the damage. Um, the group are standing behind the boss the best they can. I'm pointing the boss to the other way. So when the, co when the portal appears in a second, obviously the cone is on the other side of the room. And we're kind of just waiting now. We're making sure we've got ults ready. We're making sure we've got the boss at the right percentage. And then the portal's going to happen. It's really important not to stand too close to the portal when the portal DDs are going in. Can you see I'm standing slightly off to the side? So the portal spawns in the very center. I'm kind of off center because I know the group have got to run past me. Look, can you see the guys running into the portal? You don't want to stand on the portal because you don't want to be blowing people. People don't want to uh, be getting hit by your curse. You're going to be blowing people up. Um, so you need to be really careful of that. You don't stand too close to the middle. Off-center yourself, pointing it the other way, just to make sure people uh, have got some room to go into the portal. And here we go. We're just the same again. Uh, this time is a little bit different. So once we have reached... Um, dodge all that heavy. As you can see now, we've got fire beams. 
Can you see that I'm taking the boss backwards? I took the boss backwards a little bit there because the beam, the portal beam was right next to me and I don't want the curse to go on the person using the portal beam. So I stood back a little bit. I'm running now because I've got the curse. So I'm stacking the boss next to the, uh, um, next to the behemoth. I'm stacking the boss next to the behemoth. We're trying to push two behemoths before the portal. And I only move then either as soon as I've exploded or as soon as I get the death touch. I'm not moving un until one of those uh, situations occurs. And it's vital here to watch the, um, watch the curse here. So can you see this curse here? Went behind the group. It curved around behind the group. You've got to watch those, uh, those curses because you've got to say it's curving behind group. If you don't call those, your group can't see them. Like when you're looking at your character from um, the position that you are, it's difficult to see things coming up your screen behind your character. So you've really got to keep an eye out for those curses at this point here where they curve around and into your group. Um, and then we push the second one. As soon as the second um, behemoth spawns, we stop stacking the bosses. We don't want to push a third one. So I move the boss away and I point it towards the center of the room. Because the curse, um, I've got the curse. There it is. Dodge roll the heavy. The next portal's about to spawn. I'm pointing the boss towards the middle so that we can get the portal cone the other side of the room. Now we're getting the interrupts. And now here we go. We're waiting for the curse lock because I don't want to move. Because if I move now, I put the heavy's going, so I dodge all the heavy and I've got a little bit of a gap and I can sprint. Did you see how I kind of, I was waiting and waiting and waiting there because I didn't want to move and then curse my group. But I waited there. As soon as the heavy attack came in, I dodge rolled and sprinted and I was able to get through it. Um, if you want to avoid more damage in this fight, you can dodge roll some of the light attacks. So if you've got an abundance of stamina, if you've got loads and loads of stamina, dodge roll some of the light attacks. Because every time you dodge roll once when the boss is light attacking, you're going to dodge roll two hits. That's going to reduce your damage. Um, portal's done fast. We bring it back into the corner so that we can stack the abominations again. We want to start pushing execute soon. This is where it starts to get really tricky. So we start to get um, the meteors at this stage of the fight now. And you, have, uh, as a tank, during the meteor phase, you've got to be really, really aware of where those meteors are spawning. So if there's a meteor that appears behind you, you need to kind of move the boss out so that your group can get to it fast. That's got to die. That's the main priority. You need to move the boss or point it in a direction where it's not pointing at the uh, the group. It's not pointing um, at those meteors. Because if you point it at the meteors, your group's going to get loads of curses. So you've got to really pay attention. Keep your eye on where the where the meteors are spawning. And then either kite the boss further back. So even when the even when the portal's there, move the boss further out wide. Take it out wide if you need to, if the, if the thing's in one place. Or go inside and point it towards the middle a bit more. You've got to really, really look out for those um, for those things. So we'll play it on here. Uh, this is where it gets really chaotic. There's a lot of fire damage. This is where Encratis becomes super useful. So all this fire damage here is getting uh, reduced. We are not stacking these at this time. We don't want to get two. Um, we don't want to get two ads. We only want one ad. So I unstack Barsai so that we can just focus on the ad. And we're doing the same again. We're just pointing the boss towards the middle, ready for the next portal. So yeah, boss, I, now the, the, this is probably going to be the last portal. We're on 23%. Last portal. Portal's up. Now this is where you've got to be so careful now. When the ghosts are in, you've got the ghosts that are in the room. They, they actually uh, interfere with the boss really badly. So the boss starts to spin around and turn around. Your group have got to kill those ghosts really fast, especially on the healers and the main tank. Because... Those ghosts make the boss spin around, and if the healers aren't getting their ghosts killed, the healers die. So it's really critical that the ghosts are killed really fast. Um, mainly those ones, because it causes some severe problems. Uh, in this case, we're following. Meteor has spawned. I'm looking for the meteor. It's on the other side of the room, so I'm safe. I can keep kiting the boss around, because it's on the other side. I don't have to worry. Um, and here we go. Meteor's done. Group are following the boss again. I avoid these AoEs because I don't want to take more fire damage. There's no need to take more fire damage. There's no point in taking more fire damage. So I'm avoiding those AoEs because um, what's what's the point in getting hit by them? Uh, the Meteor. Can you see the Meteor's by the portal there? So I kind of tried to move the boss quickly so that the group can scoot through and get to the Meteor. Um, I made sure I moved, positioned the boss quickly, and then we're back into this corner again. As you can see, the boss is now turning around thanks to the ghost. Okay. Um, we're getting to the execute. We're nearly there. We're nearly done. Um, so now we pull the boss in again. Last behemoth. This is the last one we're going to kill. I'm nearly dead. I'm nearly dead, but I've managed to survive. The healer's healing me. I have got a healer that's focusing heals on me at this point still. 
Um, only one of the healers really is getting their heals over here, but they're healing both the tanks at this stage because look at the damage. Look at the health bars yo-yoing up and down. It does require a lot of effort at this point. You're spamming Igneous Shield like absolute crazy. Again, look for that curse. Curve in behind the group. Group behind group. We're calling it out because it's going to hit them. I'm moving out of the Behemoth AoE. Now we're going to skip the portal. We've got to point it still so that we get the AoE at the back of the room. The Behemoth comes in. We're not killing this one. We're skipping this one. And then we're ignoring the portal. Um, the group has still got to go for the Meteors. Dodge rolling the heavy attacks. Watching out for the curse. Here comes the portal. Now, we've got to switch direction here. My group are all blocking the way. We've got the curse, and then we move fast. As soon as that happens, and I'm calling for somebody else to interrupt at this point. I'm trying to get other people in my group to interrupt. I'm moving nice and slow. Because um, I'm holding block this entire time. I'm trying to get moved. And then my group are really quick. I run really fast past that. Um, and I actually got hit by the AoE there for the curse. But it was lucky um, not to cause me too many issues. And there we go. And that's it. That's That's the fight, guys. As you can see... The really critical points of this Barsai Hardmore fight is you've got to have some healing off your group. Like, one of the healers has got to be healing you pretty much throughout this fight. Now, when we look at the healing numbers, um, the healer healed me for about six, 700k healing. I healed myself for about 2 million or 2.5 million health just with Igneous Shield. Like, the damage shields that I got throughout this fight surpassed any incoming healing that I received. So... Igneous Shield alone is offering you 1.5 to 2 million worth of safety. It's not healing, but it's covering your health bar enough to reduce the damage by millions and millions of damage. So Igneous Shield is the most critical skill in here. Um, your Green Dragon Blood is a semi-useful skill. And then your Master Sun and Board is something that's going to probably provide you 150 to 250k healing. Your healer needs to be outputting a good, a good number as well. So like I say, my healer would probably output about 700k healing on me throughout this fight. But the healer's the one who's keeping up my critical health. So I'm shielding myself and preventing the health loss. But when I do lose health, the healer's the one that's getting me back up to full. So every time I lost health, the healer was doing that. Um, when I was losing health, I was preventing bigger losses of health, like health loss. So that was the main thing. And that is basically um, my kind of little walkthrough for Barsai hard mode as the main tank for this patch. So thanks for watching, guys.